welcome to New Song. Come sing a new song with us. Good morning, New Song. The first reading today is from Philemon chapter 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphria, our sister, to Archippus, fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. Word of God, word of life. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 15. <clears throat> this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Word of God, word of life. How are you all doing this morning? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Philemon, uh, and I am uh, one of, I have an amazing story to tell you about uh, myself. My name is Philemon, and I apologize for being dressed in, in such simpleton clothes. Uh, my Sunday clothes are at the dry cleaners, and you seem surprised that we have dry cleaners in the ancient Near East, but every, you know, we live in the desert. Everything's dry in the desert. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I live in a city called Colossae, and it's what you might call today Turkey. And it was at this Colossian church that I became a follower of Jesus in the middle of nowhere. There was this great man named Paul. How many of you have heard of the name Paul? He was a great man. Pastor Paul's not bad either. Uh, <laughs> but Paul uh, went near and far sailing to all different places, and he helped to share the gospel and spread the gospel and to teach people about Jesus. And he would go and visit the churches Unfortunately, I kind of live in the boondocks. Colossae is not like on the main track. People don't come and visit. We're kind of a small uh, town. How many of you come from small towns? Paul never came to visit us, but he wrote us a letter of encouragement for our ministry at the church. It's in your Bible. It's called the, the letter to the Colossians. And he taught us about Jesus, and he sent his assistants to preach. And it was when his, his assistants came to teach and preach about us that I learned about Jesus. I learned about all the things that Jesus did for especially those who are on the margins and those who are suffering and those who are hurt and how he transformed their lives. And then I learned about how he died at the hands of the authorities for our sins and God raised him from the dead and returned him to heaven. And then the preachers and the teachers began to tell us that we, me, I, could live a new life, that I would become a a new creation, that all my sins could be forgiven and that there was power in the name of Jesus if I believed and was baptized. And do you know what happened that very day when they came and they preached? I was baptized and I got to help build the church at Colossae. I got to be the one, and I don't like to brag. Well, I like to brag a little bit. Did you know that I'm the richest dude in the church? I've got the most cattle, the biggest house. And because I love Jesus, I'm generous with all that I have. And so every Sunday morning, I wake up and I open the doors to my home and guess what happens? People come from all over the town and they come to worship God in my home. And I welcome them and, it makes, and we sing together and we praise together and we pray together. And me, Philemon, I was able to help build the church 
in Colossae. And it gave me such joy to do so. And I was uh, filled, and I am filled with the love of Jesus. I have to tell you, though, a little story about what happened to me. One day, uh, a man came and handed me a letter. And it wasn't just a man. It was Onesimus. He was my slave. I was immediately filled with rage when he showed up because he had run away and he had left me with no notice and he was my slave. He escaped from me after I had invested so much money and time and energy and fed him and clothed him and gave him shelter and he left and now he comes back showing up. I was ready to punish him and I was filled with rage. But then he said, just read the letter. Read the letter. So despite my anger and my initial instinct, I opened up the letter. You don't know we had uh, envelopes and fine paper back in the day. <laughs> it's a myth about the papyrus. We actually had normal paper. There was a staples at the corner. And I opened up the letter carefully. And would you believe that I, me, Philemon, I received a letter from Paul the Apostle, this great man who built churches near and far all over the entire land, wrote me a letter. Me, Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, he called me his dear friend. And he saw me as his co-worker in the gospel. I was so filled with joy that I was ready to forgive Onesimus and put him back to work. I was so happy. My hospitality and all the work that I did to build the church had not gone unnoticed, and Paul wrote a letter to thank me. It says here, when I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I was so happy in that moment. But the letter continued. I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty. You know, whenever I read a letter from Paul, he begins with thanksgiving and pretty soon he's giving instructions and some of the instructions I really don't want to do. He's now commanding me to do something. It's clear that he wants something from me. My duty, have I not done enough? Have I not opened my doors? Have I not welcomed the church into my home and uh, provided for them and nourished them? What more do you want? I am the most generous of the entire church. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus. My child? You mean my slave? Whose father I have become during my imprisonment. His child? As I continued to read the letter, I discovered that Onesimus, when he ran away, he had met Paul himself. And in that relationship, Onesimus had become a disciple of Jesus. Not only that, it seemed like they were working together in that Paul, the one who taught me about Jesus, he needed Onesimus for his work, for his mission, for the very mission that had turned me into a Christian, my slave. And apparently, Paul said that I could keep him here and work with me together to do the work, but I'm sending him back to you. He sent Onesimus back to me for one reason and one reason alone. Because he wanted me to choose to set him free so that he could serve the Lord. I have to say, my head began uh, swimming around and I became very confused and 
uh, defensive and angry. And you know what else? He wrote the letter, not just to me, but to the entire church. And so here I was reading this letter in front of my sisters and brothers in Christ. Do you know how much I wanted to hide that letter and throw it away and rip it up? But I couldn't. I was with my friends in Christ. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't hide this. I was angry, I was fearful, and I was confused. Slavery served a purpose in our society. It provides stability. It creates a stable society. I provide meals and shelter and clothing for all my slaves. I'm a good master. The letter continued. You may have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave. As a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. Onesimus, my brother. I looked Onesimus in the eye. And he looked back at me. Never had he looked me in the eye. He would never dare to, but now he looked at me and there was something different about him. He seemed confident. There was no fear in him there was before. He looked at me and he loved me. And yet it was a love that would not settle for anything less than his complete and total freedom. He seemed like a man on a mission that he was called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that moment, something came over me, something changed in me, something clicked. In truth, I had always carried with me this great anxiety. It greeted me in the morning and I went to bed with it at night. How is it that I, a man could own another man. I had remembered reading Paul's letter to our church when he said, uh, there, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, circumcised and uncircumcised, slaved and free, but there is Christ in all and is all. They meant nothing to me at the time, but in this moment I understood completely as I looked at Onesimus. I owed everything to Paul and to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without Paul, I would never have met the forgiving grace and mercy of Jesus, of God. I would never have become a new creation. And as much as I thought I was a great disciple, I myself was holding that from another. How could I not see these people in my household and, and withhold Christ from them? Who am I to obstruct the will of God? In a moment, in that moment, I discovered that as much as I loved God, I had been blind to the ways in which I was harming God's people, oblivious to my privilege. I looked at Onesimus once again, and I loved him. I gave him a hug, gave him supplies for the journey, and sent him on his way. God needed him elsewhere. And do you know what? As he left, and I saw him walking in the distance, I felt a strange sense of freedom, like a yoke had been lifted from my shoulders. And I felt life and light. That Sunday morning when the church gathered together, we praised God and we prayed and we sang like never before. The entire town could hear us praising God because we were filled with joy. Somebody from our town, our city, our church, was now working with Paul to spread the gospel. We were overjoyed. Onesimus. I never heard from him for a long time. And then before I died, a letter showed up at my doorstep again. It was from Onesimus. It turns out that in his ministry and in his mission, Paul had appointed him to become the bishop of Ephesus. 
He led his own flock, his own church there in Ephesus. He had become a great leader, and now he sent a, a word, a note, to let me know that he was leading his flock, his church, and that he was spreading the gospel as a bishop. If I may offer you a word of encouragement in your mission today, fellow Christians, may I do that? I've been keeping up on your world. I got my own Twitter account. I got my own Facebook account. I see the posts that the world makes. It reminds me a little bit of myself before Onesimus came to my door. I see fear. I see anger. I see hatred. You've lost something. Compassion, empathy. You've forgotten to look people in the eyes and to understand. I invite you to try to look into the eyes of your neighbor. Seek to understand rather than to be understood. Don't stand in the way of justice and truth, but embrace the opportunities that you have to be a vessel of God's unrelenting love. Let go of the things that make you hate your neighbor. Let it go. And discover the joy of praying for and supporting those who have been called to be peacemakers, those who are persecuted for Jesus' sake. And know that I, like Paul before me, in my prayers, always thank my God. Because I hear New Song Church has a deep love for all the saints and that your faith toward the Lord Jesus continues to grow. And may the grace of that Jesus Christ, our Lord, be with your spirit. Amen.